Floss Tube. It's Brittany at Ingleside Imaginarium. You've stumbled upon my channel. Uh, if you're stumbling or if you're purposefully coming over here, I appreciate it either way. Um, but this is a channel about cross stitching and my cross stitch designs that I release under the name Ingleside Imaginarium. This is the, where are we? We are uh, on our eighth installment of a special kind of video that I call Myths and Stitches that uh, are being released alongside the parts in my 2021 mystery stitch along called the Karamos Bestiary, based all around uh, ancient Greek mythology and art and the creatures that you can find in there. So I'm going to make this quick, but I'd like to just put a couple of things out there. First of all, an apology that this video is so late things got busy and it all had to do with some of the big life updates that I may have been teasing in the last video that I made for you guys um, with the centaur and uh, I will be moving away from New York City this is not where I'm moving or New York City I'm somewhere else right now but um, that means that life feels like it's gotten really busy with things that I need to get done before leaving New York and with work and all of that kind of thing so these videos have been put a little bit on the back burner. I still intend to edit and release them as normal and film them as normal. Just the part that might get uh, delayed is the editing and releasing. But the, of course, the stitch along is one of my top priorities. So those pieces should be coming out on a normal schedule. Um, I'm gonna be moving to Nashville. Uh, if you've been watching this video, you'll know that's where I was quarantined last year because that's where my parents live. And I'm excited for a bit of a new start and perhaps getting to focus some more on my cross stitch designs or uh, some other multiple, I've got some things brewing. So I'll keep you guys updated as that uh, goes along and just in case it, it interferes with anything, I don't think it should. If anything, it just means that these videos, the myths and stitches videos will be delayed a little bit. Um, but uh, other than that, let's uh, get this bit done. Uh, I'm happy to present to you the latest part. Uh, I guess this would be October's release for the Karamos Bestiary. And that is a very good boy indeed. Our most favorite uh, dog in Greek mythology, Kerberos, the three-headed guardian of the underworld. So here you go. We have our eighth creature right there. And that is Kerberos. Um, I'm, I feel like I say it every time, but you know what? Uh, I've been told that I could do with uh, complimenting myself a little more. So um, I will say, I think I did a nice job on this one too. I'm really pleased with uh, how each of the three heads are visible and pretty readable. And um, just, I think I wanna just say that my favorite thing about this um, version of Kerberos, which I took uh, heavily um, and uh, drew inspiration heavily from an actual piece of ancient Greek art, uh, pottery, this interpretation is that I didn't realize that Kerberos had a mane of snakes, which in this interpretation ended up looking like a really luscious curly mane all the way down his back and his neck. So anyway, that's Kerberos, a very, very good boy. Uh, thanks as always for watching, thanks for your support, and thank you for understanding during this life transition that things may get a little wild. Um, but um, yeah, I think that's everything that I wanted to show you guys this time. So let's head on to an animal story, a story about Hades' best friend, Kerberos. <laughs> Hello everyone, here we are getting ready to backstitch our good, good boy, Kerberos. And uh, as you can see, we have our three heads, each one different color, all um, stitched up and our snake tail, very exciting. Uh, so yeah, let's get started and let's tell a little, uh, get a little mythy on our sweet pup Kerberos. He probably, you know, he's considered a monster, but um, he has his redeeming qualities more so than a lot of other animals or creatures on this stitch along. Um, so we can start at the beginning. Uh, who were Kerberos's parents? Although I suppose something to note before I get started 
with his parentage is I should note that I am going to refer to him as Kerberos versus Cerberus because the Greek pronunciation is Kerberos, sort of like the Hercules, Heracles um, dilemma with pronunciation. In this case, it's spelled the same, just the uh, letters are pronounced differently. So I'll be calling him Kerberos. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he has, you know, uh, we know who this dog's parents were, this monstrous dog. Because, as I mentioned in a past video, we have sort of a family reunion within this stitch along. Many, many, many of the most ferocious beasts in Greek mythology were children of who else but Typhon and Echidna. Um, and I did find out, uh, specifically when researching, um, I had tried looking it up before, but I did find out that Echidna is uh, considered to be a half-nymph, half-snake woman. So there you go. Remember when we were discussing about how, you know, almost all of these creatures have something snaky about them? You have the Hydra, of course, who is all snakes. Our Chimera has a snake tail. We have the snake tail on Kerberos. Um, the Sphinx, not, not so snaky, but um, <laughs> she has the woman part <laughs> of her mom. So, um, yes. It's Typhon and Echidna are also Kerberos's parents. So he is siblings to, in our stitch along, the Hydra, the Chimera, and the um, Sphinx. But also he has another brother who uh, is very similar to him, except he only has two heads. Um, and yeah. I did hear, when I was researching Kerberos, uh, something more interesting about the birth of all of these monsters. Um, so, Kerberos' dad was Typhon, one of the, the titans, one of the most, you know, dangerous titans, and, um, he was almost, so he was able to, to meet Echidna, and they were able to have all of their monster kids before the gods' rebellions against the titans, and, um, uh, Typhon actually could have quite uh, realistically taken down all of the gods except for Zeus. He had his thunderbolts and his lightning bolts. So um, Zeus was able to, after a very close battle, strike uh, Typhon down and send him to Tartarus, which is in the underworld. And... Um, when Typhon was banished and uh, sent to the underworld to Tartarus, uh, his children remained. And Zeus, rather than destroy them all, decided that he would let them live. However, they were going to be um, left alive in order to become the opponents of the future great heroes of Greece. So Zeus apparently had a feeling that um, things would get interesting if he uh, left the children of Typhon and Echidna um, alive and running around. And as we know, they, ha they got up to their fair share of mischief. So um, Kerberos, however, uh, he w w doesn't really terrorize anywhere, unlike our other beasts, um, and like his siblings. He was given, uh, as a puppy, once, you know, his father was, was banished, he was given as a gift from Zeus to his brother Hades. And so Kerberos now belonged to the god of the underworld, Hades, and, uh, he is known to be very, very, very loyal to Hades, and um, in one of Homer's works, uh, rather than by the name Kerberos, he actually is mentioned as just the Hound of Hades. And so, um, 
Hades raised him, I assume, from puppyhood, and then um, gave him a very important task. You know, a lot of dogs love to have a job, and Kerberos is no different. He had a job, and he was very good at his job. His job was to guard the gates of the underworld and keep souls that weren't supposed to from entering and keep any soul from getting out. Um, the distinction there is that this is the most adorable part of the mythology surrounding Kerberos is that apparently if you have died and your soul is entering the underworld, he will be at the gates and he will be so excited and happy to see you. Imagine a dog meeting a new person and meeting new friends or a dog that is seeing his owner for the first time after a long time uh, away. This is how Kerberos welcomes souls entering the underworld. I would assume that is, you know, um, souls who uh lived righteous and and well you know good good lives on on the earth and um it said <laughs> and apparently something else that was done is that sometimes people would be buried with like a snack for Kerberos so that when they went through the gates of, of the underworld they could give him a little bit of a, a treato you know a treat and uh, <laughs> uh, could could uh, make him a little less ferocious as they entered the underworld um, so that's pretty sweet however the other part of his job like I mentioned was to keep anyone from exiting the underworld unless they had expressed uh, permission from his owner, Hades, his boss. Supposedly, if a soul tried to escape the underworld, uh, Kerberos would, you know, leap upon them and tear them to bits. Something he has in common with his siblings. <laughs> Something I mentioned a little bit, but I didn't really go into detail about, um, was Kerberos's appearance. So, I mentioned he was ferocious and uh, he could make, you know, souls quake in their, in their, you know, in, on the spot when they saw him. And that's because he didn't look like a normal dog. He, from his parents, acquired some monstrous traits. Now, traditionally, Kerberos is portrayed with three heads, just like I have here. Um, three heads coming out of the one neck of the body. And he also, um, if the tradition is more loyal to the, you know, actual Greek mythology, you know, sometimes they'll give him his snake tail as well. Um, but other times, you know, artists will draw him just as a big, mean looking dog with three heads, usually black. Um, but uh, something else that has kind of been lost over the time, and maybe because it's harder to draw, or it's kind of weird looking, but apparently Kerberos not only had a snake tail, he had snakes growing out of, like, all over his body, so that he had a mane of snakes. Um, and he had lion's claws, and he had bristling teeth uh, coming out of all of his mouths. Um... Like I said, traditionally he has three heads and one snake head tail. You know, that's how you usually see him. However, sometimes he just has all of the snakes coming off his body. And I probably won't get there, quite get there, um, in our time together today. But you'll have seen the finished stitch already. And you'll have noticed that I did include his luscious mane in this version of it. Um, my stitched interpretation is very heavily based on an actual piece of Greek pottery um, and the Kerberos illustration on it in which he has a mane going down all of the necks and down his back. 
I didn't originally have that in there, but um, when I kind of doubled back to check over my design and was doing the research, I saw that bit about the, the snakes making up his mane, and I wonder if this was this uh, ancient Greeks uh, ancient Greek artists attempt to, to capture his, his mane of his snaky mane. <laughs> um, so he had this whole, you know, shaggy mane of, of hair or snakes, however you want to look at it. And, uh, he also is said to have eyes that flashed like the sparks that came out of a, a Smith's forge. So, um, imagine three heads, Lots of snakes showing their fangs and the heads, you know, bearing their giant fangs and lion claws. And I think, you know, that that's a pretty, pretty intimidating sight. I would say so. <laughs> um, and it was true. Not many people tried to get into the underworld or were successful at getting into the underworld. Um, Except, of course, it wouldn't be remarkable to say any of that unless somebody was successful at it. And I'm going to tell you of two um, men, ancient uh, men from Greek mythology, who were able to get past Kerberos and enter the underworld um, in spite of uh, him being very good at his job. Just to pause, if you're wondering why you're seeing me stitch this part again, it's because I had to frog it. Um, I missed a stitch right here and didn't go down far enough, so I'm restitching it. I took out the frogging, though, because that part wasn't exciting at all. Um, but hopefully that will give you some comfort to know that, you know, even floss tubers have to frog. <laughs> um, anyhow, I was about to tell you the story of uh, the two stories, uh, most famous stories in which Kerberos makes an appearance. Um, and we've actually already talked about some of these, uh, people in, um, the other Myths and Stitches videos. Um, one of those is a man named Orpheus, and we talked about him just last month, I believe, when we were discussing Chiron and the many famous Greek, you know, heroes and, and people that he trained, um, according to Greek mythology. And Orpheus was a... <clears throat> man. Oh, you know what? We talked about Orpheus. I don't think we talked about him in the Chiron episode. We actually talked about Orpheus way back when we were talking about the uh, siren because Orpheus uh, went along with uh, Jason, Jason and the Argonauts, um, and as they drove by the island where the sirens inhabited, he played his lyre so that... Um, the sailors aboard could not hear the siren song and jump off the boat. So my bad, excuse, excuse my, my uh, memory, but that was way back. Uh, a, no, that was a while ago at this point. Um, but having heard that story, you can guess that Orpheus was very well known along, uh, among ancient Greek um, culture and the, and ancient Greece in general. Uh, for being a tremendously talented uh, lyre player. And um, he was not only talented, he wasn't, like, you know, not only, you know, blessed because he was talented, but he also was in love with um, a woman named Eurydice. And, um, you know, it Unfortunately, his, his luck was not to last, um, and his happiness was not to last, because uh, Eurydice, while being um, assaulted, basically, and, and chased by a satyr, fell into a pit of vipers, and she was bitten, and she died. And Orpheus, wondering where Eurydice was, um, went looking for her and found the, the pit of vipers and found her body. And his, he was so heartbroken and devastated that he took his lyre out and he began to play. And as he played and, and kind of, 
you know, used that to relieve some of the emotional distress he was under. Um, many of the gods heard and came and he moved them to tears as well. And they said, um, you know what? It's obvious you both really loved each other. You know, this was... This was a love that was cut too short and we'll put in a good word for you in the underworld if you're able to get down there and talk to Hades. Um, we'll put in a good word for you and maybe you can convince him to let you bring Eurydice back. So Orpheus leapt at this second chance to, to live happily with his love and he made the trek um, to the underworld. And his first obstacle, well, I believe he had to cross the river Styx. So that was probably his first obstacle. Um, but after that, of course, he get, he came to the gates of the underworld guarded by Kerberos. And he watched from a distance and saw how ferocious the dog was and how hard it would be to sneak by him or how hard it would be to defeat him in combat. And so considering his options and considering his strengths, Orpheus did something very smart. Um, and whether he knew it would work, had a feeling it would work um, or not, um, Orpheus began to play his lyre, and the beautiful music soothed Kerberos and put him to sleep. So uh, Orpheus was able to get past Kerberos and his three heads. They were all snoozing, and he was able to gain an audience with uh, Hades and his wife Persephone. And... They weren't at first too pleased that Orpheus had made it down. And um, Hades, of course, once he has a soul, he doesn't want to let it go. That's not the natural order of things. Um, once you have become a part of his kingdom, that's where you stay, most likely. That's how it usually works. But when Orpheus told uh, them of his love for Eurydice, uh, Persephone was moved and she was able to convince Hades to allow Eurydice to go back up to the overworld and um, they would be able to continue their life together, Orpheus and Eurydice. Uh, however, there was a stipulation that the two of them had to follow. Eurydice could follow Orpheus back up to the overworld. He could lead her there, but he was not allowed to look back at her. If he looked back to see her before they reached the overworld, then she would, you know, whether she would die again or just, you know, revert back to a spirit form in the underworld, um, but she would not be allowed to live again. And um, he agreed. They both agreed. They were very excited for this opportunity, and they began the trek back, and Orpheus played the whole way, you know, I think probably to encourage Eurydice, but also to distract himself from trying to look back. Because, of course, he didn't get to see her. He just was told, she'll be following you. And, you know, when you haven't seen someone in a long time, especially after something scary has happened, like, what else do you want to do except look at them and see them and know that they're okay? And, um, you know, of course... ancient Greece, as well as being known for cool monsters and awesome pottery, is known for tragedy. And this tale has a tragic end. As they almost emerge into the overworld, something happens. And it's not consistent what happens, and it's maybe not even sure what happens. Whether it's perhaps Eurydice 
trips and makes a sound of distress which causes Orpheus to look behind. Perhaps Orpheus just can't help himself and has to get a glance at his love. Um, but he looks. He looks and he makes eye contact with Eurydice. And in that moment, she returns to the underworld. And he has to... That was his one chance. He, he doesn't get a, another, a third chance. So he has to continue his life uh, without her. Um, so yeah, very tragic, sad story. You might know that story because it's uh, been adapted into you know, many works on stage. Um, most recently, Hades Town on Broadway is based on the myth of uh, Orpheus and Eurydice, which I'm hoping to see. You know, it's open again here on Broadway. Um, and so when I feel safe enough to get to the theater, I want to see it. Um, and I'll be curious if there's any mention of Kerberos in the lyrics. I don't think there's a character that is based on Kerberos, but, you know, there could be some lyrics referencing him. Um, but that is one of the myths in which Kerberos is featured. And I don't know if you want to say outsmarted. Um, but it ha is uh, a hero has worked a way around um, his uh, work as guard dog at the gates of, ha of Hades or the gates of the underworld. Um, the other story in which Kerberos features, uh, I teased back during this month, the month of the Hydra. And that is um, the Twelve Labors of Heracles. If you recall, slaying the Lernian Hydra was one of the twelve, uh, well, technically, originally ten labors that Heracles had to do um, in order to redeem himself after he killed his family while well, under a madness influenced by Hera. Um, he was sent to King Eurystheus, and uh, King Eurystheus was um, a admirer of Hera or a worshiper of Hera. Uh, they had uh, she helped him become king, and so he, under her command, uh, tried to come up with as many of the most difficult and dangerous labors that <clears throat> Heracles would have to do in order to get you know his redemption. Um, <clears throat> And this one is actually the one that that uh, Kerberos features in is one of the later ones because King Eurystheus, after Heracles just was, you know, continued to be successful um, with these labors that were assigned to him, uh, got kind of more desperate and desperate and, and went to more and more extremes about what might take Heracles down. And in this case... He commanded Heracles to go to the underworld and bring back Kerberos, like borrow Kerberos for a day and bring him back to his court. And of course, Heracles has friends in high places. Um, Athena's on his side and Athena says, hey, I bet, you know, if you go down there and you ask, like, he might let you, you know, borrow his pet for a day and you can bring it up and as long as you return it <clears throat> and so Heracles did go down to the underworld to see if he could <laughs> take Kerberos for a little walk and he asked Hades and Hades said uh no at first he said no but then you know along with his wife Persephone she you know kind of was able to talk him around to saying hey it wouldn't be that bad um but Hades was still feeling a little um perturbed that this upstart would come down to Hades where he did not belong as a living soul he did not belong in Hades or in the underworld and so uh he told Heracles that he could borrow uh, Kerberos if 
he could tame him using no shield nor iron. So that meant that any weapon that was made of iron that Heracles had brought with him, uh, possibly to subdue Kerberos or, you know, just as stuff he normally brought with him as he traveled, he could not use. He also could not use any type of shield to protect him from Kerberos's uh, teeth and claws and snake things and things. Now, one of the other labors that Heracles had to do was to kill the Nemean lion, who was another sibling of, you know, our our monstrous family here, uh, another child of Typhon and Echidna. And um, this lion, after he had killed it, he had it skinned, and he was able to use the pelt, um, this sort of like really durable, semi-indestructible pelt as a shield when he went to face Kerberos and try and tame the beastly pup. And uh, so he approaches Kerberos and he is said to do, you know, one of a few things. He, some versions of the myth say that he was able to carve uh, arrow tips out of stone and use those instead of the iron ones. Um, some say that Heracles was able, using the, the lion skin as a, as a shield, wrestle Kerberos into submission. Um, and there are actually a lot of, uh, illustrations of Heracles doing just that, wrestling this dog, um, and quote-unquote taming him. Um, and, uh, the other is using the pelt of the lion, of the Nemean lion, and, uh, wrapping it around either Kerberos's noses or his neck and uh taking the breath out of the, the monster um so that he was subdued and Heracles could bring him to the overworld um however he did it he Heracles followed the rules <laughs> he followed the rules that that Hades had said and so he borrowed Kerberos um now Heracles is a great hero of Greek mythology, of course. However, sometimes the things I read about him, I just, you know, think maybe he's not such a great guy. Maybe he's a great hero, but he's not a great guy. Um, and one of the things I read was that he brought Kerberos up to the overworld and, like, basically rode him around showing him off for days and days and weeks until all of the other gods saw what the poor creature was going through, um, being this spectacle and being driven around um, through the lands, that they pretty much told Heracles, like, okay, okay, you've had your fun, you need to stop now, because this poor creature is suffering. So I feel a little bad, because, you know, what, at the way that, you know, it's like the Caesar Romano alpha tame, tame your dog, which you know, now is kind of being shown as, as not a great way to tame your dog or to train your dog, um, by being the alpha, you know, is not a good way to treat dogs. Um, so I'm kind of like, what was he doing that was so bad that the gods themselves had to be like, hey, 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 you know, leave the poor pup alone, like finish your task and take him home. Um, so Heracles did that. He showed up to the court of King Eurystheus and uh, <laughs> let Kerberos, I like to imagine he just like opened the doors and let Kerberos in. And the king was so scared he hid in a pot until the dog was taken away, until Kerberos was taken away and he was taken home. So what is good about this story is that Kerberos doesn't die, unlike the myths of the other creatures, of many of the other creatures featured here in our Stitch Along. Kerberos is, I would say, pretty well known uh, in modern day fantasy. You have, I feel like, a lot of iterations of the sort of three-headed dog creature. Um, Although I would say most famously, 
there is a three-headed dog in a series of movies about a wizarding school um, and that dog is guarding something very powerful and is passed by uh, music being lulled to sleep by music similar to the story of Orpheus and how he lulled Kerberos to sleep using his lyre um, but you see, you see Kerberos, uh, he makes an appearance in the Disney animated film Hercules. So you do see him there. And, um, I like him. I like him. I love the idea of him being just like, you know, bounding for joy and greeting everyone who comes into the afterlife. Um, especially if they bring him a treat. <laughs> just because... You know, a dog who's excited to see you makes you feel like the most important person in the world. And it's so, so sweet. Um, but uh, I believe that is about everything I had to say about our our sweet, our sweet puppy Kerberos. Um, I guess we can talk a little bit about, uh, you know, there, some people are wondering, you know, how did it end up, you know... Uh, there are certain people who like to try and rationalize where Greek myth, you know, all the mytho mythological creatures from Greece um, might have been inspired by. And so, like, how do you get a three-headed dog instead of just the one-headed dog, like you would find in nature? And I read a couple hypotheses, uh, hypotheses, but one was that perhaps there was a very fearsome guard dog who um had two puppies that were always by its side and so it kind of you know if if you were by a fence and uh this you know all three of these dogs kind of like stuck their heads through the fence to try and bark at you or growl at you it would look like it had two heads or three heads um so that's interesting uh, but i think that's about all i have to say about kerberos um, I have one head done. I have part of the red head down here at the bottom finished. It would have been fun to have finished, uh, it up so we'd have two heads here, but, um, you guys have already seen it and you'll be stitching your own, uh, heads on this dog too. So I don't need to stick around until I finish it. Um, but... Yeah, I always have a tough time ending these things. <laughs> um, but I hope everyone is doing okay. It's still a rough world out there, so just know that I'm thinking of you and cheering you on. Uh, I'll have some big news to tell you soon about my life um, that I'll be excited to share with you sometime soon. Um, and yeah, I'll let you know. Um, have a great month, and I'll see you next month with a new creature. Happy stitching! Bye!